Thank you. Um, let's start with the slides. American concern for objects has always been thought to be both a specific and somewhat native one. There is a love of the way that things in this country look, and yet, at the same time, a resentment that these objects fill and obliterate the landscape. It is this obsession with objects which makes still life a natural, compelling subject for many American artists. Linda Cathcart <clears throat> wrote these words in the catalog for the exhibition American Still Life, 1945 to 1983, which she organized while director of the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston. In hindsight, this exhibition was a major statement in the somewhat organized but groundswelling revival of still life painting that has been evident in American art markets since the late 1970. This past uh, summer, my colleague Sabine Rewald and I, as uh, Graham noted, began to work on the catalog of an exhibition of 20th century American still life from the museum's collection for the AFA. Um, this exhibition, and we have a version of it currently on view in the Milton A. and Helen Kimmelman Gallery at the museum, will begin a national tour early in 1997. Now, I'm certainly not going to attempt in this lecture to survey the entire history of still life, even still life in America, even still life of this century. My comments are based on my research for the AFA exhibition, as well as my own interest in examining the dynamics of memory, desire, surrogacy, and et cetera, which affect our relationships with still life in general, objects specifically. In his review of Linda Cathcart's exhibition in 1983, Barry Schwapsky, writing in Arts Magazine, noted that still life, albeit an important vehicle for formal invention in Europe and the United States, was by the 1940s shunted aside by the concerns of abstract expressionism. For an artist to choose to work in still life for the next couple of decades was, in Schwatsky's words, quote, to choose to work at the margins rather than at the center, a choice, he notes, that could be congenial to many fine talents. Schwabsky attributes the revival of still life to the return of subject matter in painting in the mainstream. This time, however, the genre, which had been considered the poor cousin of portraiture, landscape, history painting, and historical and mythological work, found its place. Perhaps it was the intensely personal nature of still life painting that complemented what social observers criticized as the excessive self-involved spirit of recent decades. In any case, still life benefited from a broader perception of the object as a cultural marker. Now before I go on, I should identify the painting on the um, left, which is Mark Tansy's Still Life 1982, which I put up first because I think it really reflects the kind of uh, ambivalence about still life objects um, that Linda Cathcart talked about. And I, it's a kind of wry commentary, both on the notion of sort of cottage industry painting, paint by number, the housewife as, you know, potential artist, and also the prosaicness of sort of just dumping, you know, this glorious um, still life in the garbage once you've finished with it. During the last 15 years or so, we've made very uh, many important acquisitions of still life paintings at the Metropolitan Museum. For the most part, however, this work manifested more conservative trends in the art world that complied with traditional notions about still life. Norman Bryson has taken notice of this condition of still life painting. In his 1990 compilation of essays on still life entitled, Looking at the Overlook, he writes that although still life is, and I'm quoting and paraphrasing here, the least theorized of the genres, as well as the most disparaged, it is nonetheless as obvious a piece of our basic cultural furniture as history painting or landscape or westerns or thrillers. Bryson continues, now of course we all know what still life looks like. That is not the problem. 
But despite our familiarity with still life, our ease in recognizing it, there is still something unjustified about the term in that it takes in so much. Pompeii, Cubism, Dutch still life, Spanish still life, trente l'oeil, collage. Why should these entirely different kinds of images be considered a single category? What is the real relationship, if any, between these images that are historically, culturally, and technically so diverse? Or is there no real relationship between them outside of the modern critical discourse? Now, Bryson's complaint, I think, is warranted because, in fact, the terminology we bring to still life conflates stylistic categories such as Cubism with nationalistic ones such as Dutch and Spanish, with geographical ones such as Pompeii, and technical ones such as Trente Loy and Collage. I think this reflects the fact that from the first moment the human species ratified its peculiar relationships with food, implements, utensils, personal items, etc., it has been preoccupied with still life. At time, decorative schemes merge with magical ones to celebrate the harvest and also to appease the powers that be so that it would continue to be available. I think that still life can be all of the above, so the question is where to limit the discussion. A good starting point would be that provided by Cathcart again in the catalog of her 1983 exhibition. She writes, still lives do not exist. They must be arranged by the artist in actuality or in the mind or through the lens of the camera. This act of arranging is indicative of artistic intent. Making still life paintings, perhaps more than making any other kind of painting, puts artists on a common ground that reveals significantly their individual sensibility. Now this definition accommodates traditional categories of still life painting that have become canonical by virtue of how these elements are combined. And it also suggests contemporary aspects of still life painting that allow not only for the contributions of newer media such as photography, but for more individual interpretive sensibilities. In Amy Weisskopf's Still Life with a Clock of 1986 on your left, for example, the elements seem familiar according to standards of still life in Europe and America dating from the 16th and 17th centuries. There are cards, a mathematician's ruler, a clock, suspended gourds, and a magnifying glass, all comprehensible within traditional notions of the transience of the physical world. But Weisskopf, I would suggest, goes the extra distance to drive the point home. Certainly the clock noting the passage of time is the most obvious. But instead of simply allowing the gourds to rot and wither away, Weisskopf sets them up so that they rot, wither away, and then fall down onto the table for a more dramatic effect. Furthermore, the House of Cards adds an element of disequilibrium about the inevitability of such transactions conveying a more modern psychological element to this theme. On your right, Paul Warner's 1983 Still Life with the extended title, Dutch Still Life with Orchids, Postcard View of Paris and the Death of Marat, like Weisskopf's painting, brings a range of strategies from the past to a contemporary situation. This intricate composition includes several varieties of orchids, tulips, camellia, freesia, flowering rosemary, in a variety of containers, both elegant and found. Um, when I was writing up this um, painting, I, I was sort of lead, leaving for on vacation, and I sort of realized that if I was going to be a real smart ass, I should identify the flowers. So I was, I was trying to sort of figure out where I could get a gardening book, and the only one I knew that was ready at hand was at a friend's house in Connecticut. And so I went, um, so I went back to my office from the storeroom and I ran into our gardener and I went, Ben, <laughs> of course Ben would know. So I dragged him down to look at the painting and Ben identified all the different kinds of orchids and things like that. But then he got into this whole quarrel with the artist and he kept saying, well, you can't have camellia at the same time as flowering freesia, it's just not seasonal. I went, Ben, it's a painting. Um, but I think that in many ways what he did was that he uh, pointed out and he sort of recognized 
certain aspects about how Warner develops his co compositions. Because although the, the formal organization and the attention to botanical detail indicates a more careful calculation, Warner actually works much more spontaneously. He's written, I first set a background and a floor plan, and then I paint the objects separately, not arranged ahead of time. I seldom know what will come next, and the final result is always somewhat of a surprise to me. Now, I think if we look very carefully at this composition, we can see how the artist is exploiting the subjective linear designs that develop as each object and its shadow leads to another through the painting. You could probably read it if you want, going from left to right. The structure of the composition is determined by the interplay between horizontal and vertical elements, which are set against the, uh, the diagonals of the shadow lines, the misalignment of the cardboard boxes and crates, the sheet of paper on which the artist has signed and dated the painting, and the green pencil, which you can see at the very bottom of the composition. Within the pervasive stillness of this work, Warner again introduces indications of the passage of time. If you look carefully, two blooms have fallen off of the purple orchid, um, which is in the center of the composition. Several of the daffodils show wear, and the tulip petals are opened well past their prime. <laughs> 